Good afternoon and welcome to today's meeting of the CFA's Corporate Governance Committee. I confirm that Councillor Ball was nominated as Chairman-elect of the Corporate Governance Committee at the CFA's annual meeting on the 16th of June. And I ask the committee to confirm this. Do I have a nominator and a seconder, please? I propose Councillor Bull as chair. Thank you. I wish to second that uh, appointment. I now confirm Councillor Ball as chairman of the Corporate Governance Committee and I hand over to you, Councillor Ball. Yes, um, well, thank you, Anna. And uh, thank you, members, for confirming my appointment um, as your chairman for the forthcoming municipal year. Um, it's the first time that I've actually chaired a meeting from this rather uh, exalted position. Um, it's, uh, I think, quite a privilege. And I would say, and you may excuse my humour, but um, for the many years that I've been coming to Glenfield in various meetings, I've always admired your past uh, chairman's portrait gallery outside. And I noticed that um, two of them have shotguns across their laps so uh, so i guess that they probably had no uh, problems or issues in in chairing me meetings but it does bring a new connotation to uh, this committee when we say fire and rescue but uh, uh, i will move on that's just but but thank you thank you all again um, so welcome to this first meeting in the municipal year of the cfa's corporate governance committee um, as usual, the meeting is being broadcast live on YouTube and will also be available for viewing after the meeting. Uh, the link is available on the CFA website. This will be the first time that this committee has been able to meet in person uh, for more than a year, actually, due to the continued restrictions. And therefore, we are limited with the number of people we can have in the room. And therefore, the majority of officers will be joining uh, the meeting virtually. But of course, we have uh, Callum Fate, who is our chief fire officer, and uh, Lauren Haslam, the monitoring officer, here in the room. And of course, we also have, as you've already seen, uh, Anna Poole. Um, we couldn't run this meeting with, without her. Um, and then online, um, joining us online, we have Colin Sharp, Neil Jones and Paul Weston. So with that in mind, can I ask that all members and officers have their microphones on mute until they wish or invite or are invited to speak and that officers show their video cameras only when presenting reports. Uh, so please ensure that mobile phones also are switched to silent. Um, as we have a, a number of newly elected members joining this committee, I, I think I'm going to ask that perhaps we uh, introduce ourselves and we can simply work around the room. Uh, that will help Anna in taking the minutes, etc. And perhaps start with myself. Well, I'm, I'm Kenneth Wool. I'm the Rutland County Councillor for the Normanton Ward, and I've been elected to represent uh, Rutland on this particular committee and of course the CFA. So may I go to the left and we'll work around the room. Well, my name is Kamal. I come from Oldby. I've been elected from Oldby and uh, I present Oldby area. Mrs. Newton, but not everyone does. Hi, my name is Betty Newton. I'm a Labour County Councillor and I've been on the Fire Authority for quite a number of years. And I can tell you it's one of the best committees to be on. Shall I just go to the back and I'll come to Mr. Bannister in a moment? I'm Councillor Mahindra Wallen, Belgrave Ward, Leicester City. Thank you very much, sir. I'm Councillor Louis Fonseca, not having to involved Leicester City Council. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Neil Bannister representing the Borton Astley Division at Leicestershire County Council. That's very helpful. Thank you. We we'll go to the back end. Councillor Barry Champion, Market Harbour East. I'm substituting for Councillor Ross Hills. Hi, yes, I, I'm Stuart Bray. I'm the Liberal Democrat County Councillor for St Mary's Division and I'm returning to the Fire Authority after a number of years off. 
course, and our, our chief, uh, Callum Faint, Chief Fire and Rescue Officer for Leicestershire Fire and Rescue Service. Good afternoon, members. I'm Lauren Haslam. I'm um, Director of Law and Governance at Leicestershire County Council and the Monitoring Officer of the CFA. Thank you. OK, that's fine. So, therefore, um, I'm just going to move on. So therefore, um, we now need to move to the election of our vice chairman. And I would like to propose from the chair, uh, Councillor Mrs. Newton. Can I have a second? Yes, yeah. I'll second it. We have to, were you happy? <laughs> right, so that's, that's unanimous. Welcome uh, Mrs. Newton to be vice chair, uh, a very long serving member of, of this committee. So agenda item three, going to the agenda proper, um, is apologies for absence. I have received apologies from Mr. Hills, County Councillor, and I would welcome Mr. Barry Champion, who is substituting for him today. Um, I have also received a, a late notice um, from apology from Mr. Orson, who is unwell, uh, but he is actually going to, he won't be able to participate, but he is going to join us to watch online. Agenda item four um, is to declare declarations by members uh, of any interest in respect of items on the today's agenda. And are there any declarations from members? Being a new committee and a new start, I think not. OK, so that's cleared. Um, agenda item five to advise of any other items which the chair has decided to take as urgent. Again, because of the start of the new committee, there are uh, no urgent items. Agenda item six is uh, the chairman's announcements, and, and I have two, and they are, they are good news announcements. Um, on the 2nd of July, the chief fire officer and officers were proud to see the 16 new whole time recruits pass out from the fire service college after completing their initial training course. They were join their watches and stations in August following a period of conversion and some very hard earned uh, annual leave. Um, and the second, and well, I, I may just ask the chief to say something just on that in a moment. Um, and the second one is I am pleased to say that uh, the contract for a new high reach appliance has now been awarded. This is the high reach ladders um, that has been following some intensive work because the specification is so, so difficult to get right. It's so important given the cost. And uh, it's gone through the full procurement and tender process and delivery is anticipated in approximately 15 months uh, from now. And I think to elaborate a little more on that, um, we've all seen uh, you know, the, the fire engines with blue lights flashing by and I instinctively know that there is a value in, inherent in that of quarter of a million pounds, 250,000 pounds, and the support services to getting that fire engine out and about and on the road permanently, as it were, in a good condition is probably another uh, quarter of a million. So that's my financial sort of brain working as I see that happening. Uh, but of course, when we're talking about a high reach ladder, I think we are talking three times that. I think we are talking towards three quarters of a million pound. And we have two of those, one coming to the end of its life at 20 years and one about halfway through that. I'm just wondering, Chief, whether you would just like to uh, add a little bit about the new recruits and then just a little bit more about this uh, this spend that you've been very carefully and uh, confidently taking us through. Thank you. Uh, certainly, Chair. Um, yeah, it's really nice to welcome the recruits back from the Fire Service College. We've, um, we're have we ready for some reinforcements to reach the front line, which is um, really well timed. They've been an exceptional cohort. They've bonded exceptionally well. Um, incredibly diverse in their life experiences, age, range, gender and ethnicity. So a really, really excellent bunch of individuals that joined together to become a very, very comprehensive and formidable team. Uh, and we're warmly welcoming them back into service. We are being generous and giving them a couple of days rest because they have, uh, have, have worked their socks off. With regards to the high reach appliance, um, 
we plan for these vehicles to have a 20 year lifespan. So it's important that we do the due diligence up front to make sure they're fit for purpose, not only now, but for what the, the county and the city are likely to emerge into over the next 20 years. So I have been particularly a, a stickler in the mud around the specification of this vehicle to make sure it's absolutely right. It's a, an incredibly large spend for a single vehicle. Um, I am confident having listening to the crews um, engaged with other fire and rescue services and the suppliers that what we're procuring now will be an excellent addition for our fleet uh, and to enhance our operational capabilities, not only with high reach buildings and tall buildings, but equally if we have um, significant fires or any other kind of domestic rescues, it's able to be used in a lot more different environments to be more flexible and to provide us an increased reach. So we're getting a 42 metre aerial appliance on this procurement, which is a lot bigger than the 27 to 30 metres we currently have. So a real good addition to our fleet. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you for that, uh, Chief. And I'm, I'm sure members in in an appropriate time in the future when we take delivery, it will be a, a, an interesting piece of equipment for us all to go in and view and to understand all the uh, workings and complexities. But thank you again for that. Agenda item seven, um, we need to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of March 21. And again, I think for expediency and with new members, I'm going to propose that we accept those uh, minutes from the chair. I know I bet he was present. And uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask uh, Anna just to record, if you like, um, uh, not, an, not an apology, but uh, and yes, an abstention for, for new members, and that will just tidy up that small administration point. So thank you for that. Um, we will now therefore move on to our first report, which is agenda item eight. It's after the incident um, survey. It's an annual report for 2021. Uh, it's on pages 15 to 40 of your agenda pack. And I think on this uh, particular thing, I'll be going straight to Paul Weston. We are. So the floor is yours, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Uh, I would like to present the annual report, the 2021 report uh, for after the incident survey. Just to give you a, a bit of a background, uh, at the end of every year, the Fire and Rescue Service go out to uh, the community, to users of the service to ascertain what their experience was, uh, are there, is there any learning that we can take from it. Prior to 2019, um, the service employed a company called Opinion Research Services, ORS. And this was done on a and on an annual basis where at the end of every year they would contact service users uh, and get feedback. Now, one of the downsides to that process was it could be up to 15 months before we got feedback. So in 2019, 2020, the service evaluated the provision and changed to Leicestershire County Council. The benefits of doing that is we can now actually engage with the community and get feedback almost on a weekly basis. You will see for the year 2020 to 2021, we received 236 feedback uh, forms. Uh, from those feedback forms, 99.6 of service users were expressed overall satisfaction from the service and from what they'd received. That's broken down then into various areas. So how we deal with a the initial 999 call. So that is the service user's um, initial contact with our control room. We then review whether they um, experienced any delays in attendance of any appliances. Was it uh, as expected? Was it longer than expected or was it quicker? Uh, and as you can see from para 12 of your report, 99.6 uh, respondents believe that the fire engine arrived as they expected or quicker than that was expected. I won't go through the, the rest, but as you can see, we capture an enormous amount of data that has a positive impact in the organisation. And as I've said, the benefits of receiving that information on a timely basis it allows us to uh, act or react if there are there are any problems um, that occur 
rather than wait the, the potential 15 months uh, that we used to. Chair, I'm happy to answer any questions on the, the report or the subsequent appendix. Well, uh, thank you, Paul. I think, as you have said quite rightly, uh, it is indeed uh, a good news report. I think uh, we have to remember that members of the community at these particular times, uh, to put it mildly, are under extreme pressure. And uh, if your property or your house is on fire, I I'm sure that uh, every minute could almost seem, you know, double or treble that. So the fact that they they thought that there was indeed a, a fast response um, is, is really excellent. But uh, can I open that for any comments? Uh, Councillor Newton. About the computers in the way, sorry about that. It's really around um, the fact that um, People have said that 65% uh, said that some other people called on their behalf and um, only 9%, and this is the one I really wanted to ask for more information on, only 9% had an automatic alarm system. I just wondered whether or not there might be a public relations exercise that we could embark upon to get people to perhaps look more seriously at fitting alarms. Thank you. Callum or, or Paul, um, whichever. Uh, but Paul will answer that, Paul. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your question, Councillor Newton. The uh, ones that had the alarm, that is a, a linked alarm, an automatic fire alarm. Uh, and what happens is where, the, where an, an incident occurs in that property, it automatically dials uh, the fire and rescue service. It doesn't cover those people that do um, that have a or don't have a, a domestic smoke alarm it's purely from a more a commercial basis uh, or a residential care home or residential sheltered accommodation um, but you you're you're quite correct the drive for us is to publicize the importance of having working smoke alarms uh, within properties uh, and I'm sure my service delivery report at full CFA uh, in two weeks' time, we'll, we'll give you the, the positive impact that we've had in that area. Thank you, Chair. I'll take Mr Bannister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I thought this was an excellent uh, report, showing great confidence in, in those that um, have had to suffer incidents in the, um, the response that was provided. Um, uh, and I appreciate the Fire and Rescue Service can't be in any way complacent, but it certainly is indicative of a good job being done. Uh, my question is in relation to uh, page 36, which is the respondent demographics. And uh, at face value, I, I have a little bit of a concern about the um, ethnicity of the respondents to these surveys. Uh, the overwhelming majority uh, of those respondents are white. And I do wonder whether or not um, there are barriers that are getting in the way of uh, Indian, Asian or African uh, blacks in being able to uh, respond and what sort of work is being done to overcome those barriers and challenges. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor, for your question. Again, a really good question. We, from a fire and rescue perspective, we are working extremely hard uh, in how we engage with our underrepresented uh, groups of the community. And uh, through our Strategic Equality and Inclusion Board, we commissioned a piece of work through Leicester University that actually identified people from uh, a uh, BME background have a lack of trust or perceived lack of trust within the fire and rescue service and that may be because of countries that they've actually migrated from the authorities there are not as trustworthy as um, services within the United Kingdom and we've looked at how we can break down barriers and one of the um, one of the outcomes from that uh, report were to ensure that we have that trust within the community. We need to change our literature. Um, if you look at fire and rescue service literature previously, you'll see that you'll see 
pictures of people with helmets on, with breathing apparatus in a dramatic scenario. What we've found or what the what the report found and what the uh, evidence points to is people are more likely to engage if they see a face and a smiley face, a friendly face. So we're altering our literature and our engagement with uh, the community to adopt that approach. Hopefully then uh, we can start to see an increase in respondents, not only to after the incident surveys, but also when we go out for our integrated risk management public consultation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the Oh, so supplementary. Well, just very briefly, the, the pictures referred to in the literature, um, in addition to smiley, happy faces, a face that um, those looking at the literature can recognise as a uh, face similar to their own, whether it's male, female, black, white, Asian, uh, uh, um, whatever. So I, I'm sure all that is being taken on board. Yes, I'll, I'll just um, ask our... Uh, Chief Fire Officer Callum Fain to come in on that as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cass. A, a very fair question and one that isn't easily answered with, with one answer. And I think um, the Assistant Chief's given an example. We are working very hard to promote the fire and rescue services across the whole community, but specifically in BAME areas. We currently have are, are planning another whole time recruitment campaign, which will focus heavily on positive action in those communities, not just centering around the recruitment, but also how we interact with those communities on a daily, weekly, monthly and yearly basis. Um, I'm I'm with you that there, we can't be complacent and there is more work to do in how we attract and promote ourselves with uh, diverse communities. I'm hopeful and relatively confident these figures will continue to improve as we go through the months and years. Um, we've got a very good outreach program with a lot of um, talented individuals who do represent those groups working with the communities. Um, but you're right, we've got to challenge ourselves and we've got to push further, harder and faster. I, I agree. Thank you, Chief. Can I bringing Councillor Newton. Yeah, I'd just like to say um, we have a working group called, well, the Audacious or SEDIP set up, and we're the Equalities Working Group. And we've actually, last year, we won an award for our positive action work alongside the police. That we were the two organisations that won an award. It's just to say that I actually sit on that particular group. I know how hard they work, but I know how much more work that needs to be done and I don't think they'll shirk in, in that at all. I don't think I'd let you say anyway. But but we take equalities really seriously. And from a member perspective, and I know from an all perspective as well. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, thank, thank you, Betty, for that. Yes, and, and I would endorse uh, the comments made by the Chief, but I would also uh, welcome uh, the question. I think these are very important questions, particularly at the start of a, a new min, municipal term or, or even year in this particular first case. Um, and both from our historical work, it is an area that we've continued to look at. But as the chief has said, you know, we, we mustn't be complacent. We must aim to do better. And I am confident that we that we will do just that uh, as we progress forward. But a, a very valid question and I think a very useful question. Thank, thank you. Members, if there are no other questions on this particular report, then um, as a committee, the recommendation before us is that the committee is being asked to note the findings, to note, that is not a vote, to note the findings of the after the incident survey 2021 um, and identify any areas for further analysis, which I think uh, we, we have covered. As I would say, uh, I think it's a very good report. It does show um, excellent confidence you know in the service and i would therefore just move from the chair that that is uh, duly noted so we therefore go on to agenda item nine which is the performance monitoring oh yes well yes okay just formally in, in my council if it's noting sorry we is noted i'll have a seconder quite right uh, councillor newton councillor bannister thank you for second that thank you very much apologies um Right, so therefore we move on to agenda item nine, um, performance monitoring April 2020 to March 2021, and uh, bringing right up to date April 21 to May 21. It's on pages 41 to 112 of your agenda pack. Um, again, I think it's uh, 
a, a positive report. But as I think when you will have read it, um, it, it is COVID uh, um, impacted. And uh, there is a little more, which I think our, our chief will add to that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd, I'd echo your comments. That it's an incredibly strong um, set of performance figures, um, but it would be remiss of me not to kind of highlight the fact that they have been impacted by the pandemic. Um, and as we come out of the pandemic, we'll keep a very close eye on how those incident trends continue to occur. Um, the, the pack itself is incredibly detailed with an awful lot of information, and I'm sure members will be glad to hear that I'm not going to go through every part of that. If I could focus your attention to page 45 and 47 of your bundle, which is the complete performance update for April 2020 through to March 2021. Um, pretty much across the board, there are impressive reductions in number of incidents, number of fatalities, number of casualties. Um, all the positive indicators that are available to us there kind of show just how well the service has done throughout the pandemic. And I am especially grateful to all of our staff for, for not only doing their job but doing their job well whilst facing the the personal challenges of of covid um in particular i'd like to draw members attention to the increased productivity across our fire protection and fire protection uh, protection and prevention activities uh, namely kci 4.1 which is on page 47 of your um, bundle which relates to the number of home fire safety checks we've conducted across the county sorry our service area llr um, so even in the face of the pandemic, the productivity for that has increased. We fitted more smoke alarms and given more safety advice. And that's a really positive trend of productivity that I am exceptionally keen on with my officers and the senior team are working hard to maintain that trend. Also, I'd like to draw uh, members attention to KCI 5.1, which is number of fire protection audits carried out. So again, even in the face of the pandemic, when a number of businesses were closed, we've really focused on the fire protection and the number of audits we've completed in properties across the service area. Again, this is a trend I'm absolutely dead set on continuing, that we continue to increase our protection and prevention activities to hopefully try and reduce the number of fire, fires and emergency incidents that we attend. I think it's also important to note that for both of those activities, we've also sought to get feedback from the community as we've been doing it. Those are contained within the, the performance bundle as well and kind of show that public perception and public appreciation for us remains high, not only across the operational areas, as we talked about, but also in the fire prevention and protection areas, particularly fire protection that can be awkward as we do prosecute a number of those people if they don't conform to the fire legislation. But even in the face of that, the customer satisfaction remains incredibly high. Um, however, I'm sure members will have noted um, KCI number two, which is on page 45, and this is around the number of non-fire related deaths that we attend and that those numbers seem to go up. I think it's important just to cover that, that those numbers are going up because we are attending more of those incidents on behalf of the police or on behalf of the, the ambulance service. So rather sadly, those deaths have always occurred. It's just as a service, we haven't been going to them or responding to them. And now to aid greater collaboration we are attending more of those incidents which um, is exposing the fire and rescue crews to more fatalities and more traumatic circumstances um, i and the officer team still believe it's the right thing to do for those individual people who may be in distress or have passed away certainly for the families of those people involved and for the wider community in general we still believe it's the right thing for us to attend those incidents it releases some capacity back to the ambulance service and the police service to go around their general business. Um, but we are not neglecting the impact that has on our staff. We've introduced over the last 12 to 18 months a system called TRIM, which is Trauma Risk Intervention Management, which basically is a, a safe and secure and confidential way for staff to debrief those traumatic incidents, um, whether that be as an individual or on some occasions as a team, um, dependent on the circumstance. So it's a way of looking after our staff to continue to come into work and to continue to go to those traumatic incidents, knowing we are having the better effect for the community as a whole. Um, I'd also draw members' um, attention onto page 81 of the bundle, which shows our performance in April and May of 2021. Those positive trends continue or appear to continue still being there, but I would say the data numbers are still quite small at the moment, so it's probably a little bit too early to draw any conclusion around those continued trends. Um, and my only word of caution is looking forward relates to um, sickness absence for the service. 
At the moment, we are seeing an increased number of people going off absent. Some of that is COVID related and self-isolating related, but equally some of that is that um, elective or non-emergency service, uh, non-emergency surgery has recommenced. And we are seeing a number of our staff that have had operations delayed throughout COVID now being called up to that. So the sickness levels uh, may well go up, but I think they're all for, for genuine and bona fide reasons. And certainly the management team are very much over it. Um, so that uh, without going into the infinite level of detail contained within the report, which is an exceptional report, um, I just thought I'd, I'd leave it there and ask members if they have any specific questions. Thank you, Chair. Yes, well, yes, uh, well, thank you, Chief. I, yes, I think uh, as you've already um, highlighted regarding, if you like, absence calls through um, withheld sort of surgery, then you may wish to take a longer look as an average, uh, and because I think, as you said, the figures are probably skewed. We probably had better lower figures because of that uh, historically, and now uh, a, a short-term increase, I guess. And I think the the other one, which you quite rightly pointed out, is where we are assisting the other services more. I guess they're almost being double or tripled triple reported. We will be reporting them in our own right, as will the police or ambulance. And that's how it works, is it? Uh, yes, Chairman. Um, because we attend those incidents at, and encounter the circumstances, it's only right that we record that through our incident recording system and report that through to yourselves and indeed the Home Office. But obviously, it's the ambulance or the police call of origination so that they're the kind of lead authority so some of these are around um unfortunately tragically suicide attempts and some of them are around concern for welfare for someone who's not been seen for a number of days or weeks and under the fire and rescue services act we have a a good ability to force entry to those properties to check for the welfare um and that allows police to continue on doing the rest of their duty so it, it feels like the right collaboration to do and i am genuinely um, believing in that, particularly for the individuals involved. If it was my family, friend or loved one on the floor, I'd, I'd want someone to help them. And we're in a position to do that. Thank you. I, I think you're absolutely right in that. It, it just occurs to me that you, you and your officers may look um, at how you present the figures, or whether, where, if you like, um, there are fatalities, if you like, in our own number one core, and perhaps highlight them where it's an assist figure. I, I, that will probably, looking back, will give a more uh, balanced approach, but I will leave it in your your very capable hands if, if you think that. Um, members, um, I'll take Mr. Bannister and then I'll come to Mr. Fronseca. Uh, thank you for that report. And uh, again, it across the board, it looks like a, a very good uh, news uh, story. And I really appreciated the detail uh, given in that uh, report uh, as well. Uh, and um, like you, I, I had a concern about the fatalities in non-fire incident figure and why that's gone up. And the background to a lot of these figures is, of course, the, the COVID-related and the pandemics. And I noted in the detail of, of the non-fatal, uh, sorry, the fatalities in non-fire incidents, there were an element of uh, persons taking their own lives. And this may be new to uh, fire officers who are attending because of the new uh, spirit of collaboration that took place during the, the pandemic. Uh, and I'm sure that had an effect on uh, the, um, the fire officers attending. So thank you for your comments about TRIM. Um, but I also wonder, because of the background of COVID, whether or not the actual incidents of those taking their own lives um, in the pandemic and the, the pressures on individuals' uh, own mental health has increased over the, the, the past um, 18 months or so. And I just wondered what your experience uh, might be of that. Um, thanks, sorry, Chair. Um, it's a really difficult one. Certainly, it feels like the Fire and Rescue Service have been called to more. Um, but what I can't say is how many have gone on away from the incidents we attend around suicide. Um, certainly, dependent on the nature of how an individual chooses to take their life. Certainly, if it involves chemicals, we are much more likely to attend or um, however they do that. I, I can't really comment as to whether the number of suicides has gone up because we only attend a very small portion of them. Um, but it feels from a fire service perspective, it feels like it's increased, yes. 
Okay, no supplementary there. You're, yeah. So I have Mr. Fonseca and then I have Mr. Champion. Mr. Fonseca. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks for that detailed report, performance report. And everything points out to positivity as usual. Right? A very good report, very detailed. And uh, yeah, again, when we consider uh, when we consider people's view of this as well, I might it's always positive. That's one aspect which you just go a little closer to the microphone. I, I think I detect okay. one or two oh, members sorry. are just having I, it's okay. not easy on this system, but apologies. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was just sort of, you know, I mean, uh, being positive about the work being carried out by uh, um, by LFRS. Um, yeah, I have one small question. That's regarding false alarms. Now, as you see, it's almost doubled, taking the first three years consideration of 1095 average, it's doubled to 2204. Um, um, why is that? And the second issue is about uh, you touched upon good intent and uh, yeah, good intent calls and false uh, alarms as well. So I'm a bit confused in that. So could you please explain on that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, certainly, it's a it's a very valid question. We we quite often fall into the um, the, the realm of fire service speak and, and don't often explain ourselves completely. So, um, false alarm is a very wide statement that we have to break down into a subcategory so that we can really understand what it is. So, false alarm good intent is a call made by a human when they genuinely believe there to be an incident. So, for example, if you saw smoke coming from your next door neighbour's garden, you rang through and said, "I think their shed's on fire." And as we get there, it turns out it's a bonfire that's completely well attended to and there's no issue for it to attend. You've called us with genuinely good intent that we will go to an incident. So that one covers the false alarm good intent bracket. Um, false alarms by themselves could be automatic fire alarms. So, for instance, in a premise as we're in now, there are smoke detectors that um, are throughout the building or heat detectors or, or infrared detectors, whatever it may be. Um, they can often get um, malfunction, whether it's a system fault, whether thrips or dust get into the system and it signifies that there's an alarm and there's fire that one is a false alarm due to apparatus which is the larger one of our call volume if i'm honest around the automatic fire alarm systems and then unfortunately we still have the false alarm malicious calls which is where an individual or a group of individuals will deliberately make a false call just to send us on a wild goose chase for whatever their purposes may be. Thankfully, across the service area, those number of calls are low, um, but it is a still still a bugbear of ours that we would like to get through. Um, so there are a number of different categories. So the false alarm good intent is made by a human with genuine intent. Malicious, again, is made by a human with malicious intent. And uh, a false alarm due to apparatus is due to whether it be a system faults or a false detection where it thinks there's a fire, but it disco smoke would be a prime example for it. For instance, do you have a supplementary? No, no thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, actually, follows on from my my colleague's comments there. I think being new to this authority, looking through these figures, the one that shocked me was two thousand seven hundred and fifty nine false alarms. Um, that's thirty six percent of your call outs. What sort of cost is that to the authority? Would be my first question. Um, with that, does that have a knock on effect? Have we had instances where there's fatalities, et cetera, elsewhere because crews have been called out to false alarms? Um, what do you, uh, do, what actively do you do to look at how you could reduce that? I mean, I, this is just top of my head, but thinking when I came over and we had the, the walk around, you had the fire bike there, the motorcycle. If you had one of them in every area, every area, 11 areas, and when you get a call out, one of those shoots off to the site first. And you've got an experienced fire officer that can go there and check. Your crew's probably only halfway there at that point. You could cancel that call and get them back to station. And all you've used is someone to go out quickly, like the paramedics do with their motorcycles, to check. Just as a thought, it might be a way, because it's such a huge number that you're called out. And you've got obviously all that crew have got to get back, get the kit back in, make sure everything's back in the right place. I expect it takes quite a bit of time. Just be interested in what you're doing to look at how you can reduce the impact of, of false alarms. Well, thank you for that question, Chief. Thank you, and sorry for turning me back on you while I answered for the microphone. Um, 
If we start with cost to the authority, that's, that's a very difficult one to say. So I don't have a cost per call because it will depend on the type of the premises, the number of fire engines that attend and the shift system of the fire engine that attends. So I don't currently have that cost per call. We could ultimately add all the calls up and divide it by the cost of the budget of the service. Um, and I think the the important question is, what are we doing to reduce those number of calls? Uh, and the answer is quite a lot. So if we were to look historically, um, that the previously in the last sort of 10 years ago, the number of calls we went to that false alarm was probably in the region of 60% of our total calls. So our command and control centre that takes the emergency calls or the automatic fire alarms as they come in, challenges a number of those calls. And if there, if for example, it's an office building during the daytime, there are people in the building, the alarm's gone off, but there is no sign of fire, we won't then mobilise to that unless they call back and confirm it as being a fire. The difficulty we have is some premises, for example, such as a hospital, the risk is so significant there that if we are delayed by a minute or two in the occupiers going back to look at that property and a fire is actually there and developing, we wouldn't want to have wasted those two minutes or delayed the crews attending for those two minutes. So we take a very much a risk-based approach of where it's safe to call challenge and not mobilise, we will do that. Um, where there is significant risk in the property and we don't, we haven't got the appetite for that risk, we will continue to mobilise. But if it turns out to be a false alarm, we will stand down en route. So whilst the number may be high, we don't necessarily attend that number of incidents completely ourselves. And equally, our command and control staff in the control room are, are exceptionally talented in what they do. And they will prioritise, even if we're responding to an automatic fire alarm and a confirmed fire comes in, a confirmed road traffic collision comes in, we will divert those fire engines to the more life critical incident um, as and when we can do so. There is the option of a fire bike or a rapid response vehicle. We have a number of tactical response vehicles um, across the county. Those are working very well for us at the moment um, and dependent where the authority chooses to go with the day crew plus um, removal of the day crew plus across the service and um, that may provide the opportunity for more of those tactical response vehicles but i wouldn't want to suggest we're doing that until the authority knows the the full understanding of where we are with dcp so hopefully that's answered your questions if not please feel free to thank, thank, thank you Callum. yeah it does it gives me an idea of what's going on and there was, there was just one final thing as i was looking through and i saw like on the non-fatal incidents um it still seems predominantly quite a lot of people are still being caught out with chip hands um, now, I remember as a kid, there always used to be adverts going on the new, about, you know, be careful with your chip pans. Because now, obviously, as people have moved over to the electric versions, I expect there's less of a problem. But is there a chance of a, a thing of a public engagement here um, to, to sort of concentrate and maybe divert people onto the safer system rather than the pan on a gas stove? Uh, yes, certainly. So um, traditionally, uh, the real campaigns in the 80s and 90s were national level campaigns where um, TV adverts across the across the country were very successful. Um, there are still a number of instances. In fact, majority of domestic fires are started within the kitchen area due to cooking, uh, not only chip pans, but cooking and potentially even cooking Texas. when you come come back from a, a night out or, or whatever, wherever you may have been. Um, a lot of our engagement with the communities had to cease through COVID. We're exceptionally keen to get back out and re-engage with the community. Um, we actually do a number of demonstrations, whether it be at station open days or, or community events, fates, et cetera, around the dangers of cooking with chipping, uh, chip fat oil and oil. And especially if you were to put water onto that, the, the ramifications of that. So as soon as we can get back out and engage locally with the community, the crews are raring to do it. And we're, we're absolutely keen to, to get back onto that safety message. It's one we will have been pushing for a number of years. And sadly, I think it's one we're going to continue to push for another number of years. Um, but the number of chip pan incidents have, have come down over the years. Yes, well, again, thank you for uh, another very valid question. It, this is a, I guess in every fire service, it's almost a, a hardy annual when you look at these sort of figures and uh, they need some understanding. And I'm thinking in a future agenda, we may perhaps be useful for members if we dwell down, we, we you know, drill down a little on this particular topic um, because, uh, as you quite rightly said, Chief, the last thing we want to do as the fire service is to try and shut down the well-intentioned call. They undoubtedly save lives, but uh, as members, new members will find, uh, regretfully, once you, there is smoke invariably coming out of a bedroom window, 
when the crews entered, I'm afraid it's very often a, a fatality there because of the oxygen and everything else, and we can deal with that. Um, and I'm also mindful of something that you haven't mentioned, um, which again goes on the figures, is our duty uh, if there's a fire uh, within the prison service somewhere uh, invariably that fire is being put out but we have a statutory duty to attend to literally sign off the fire and, and that literally goes down on our numbers and also what what you are doing um, there on the force alarms front we have a focus on some of our past papers where there was uh, some businesses who had shall we say 40 alarms that needed attention and when you found it they were calling out six, seven, eight, nine times, then you engage with them uh, very smartly and, and brought about improvements. But uh, I, again, it's a, an excellent question and uh, all the reasons are there. But sorry, Chief, come back to you. Again. Yeah, just to add to that, that the crews would be incredibly cross with me if I didn't add, we, we don't tend to go to false alarms. We only come back from false alarms. So every call has a potential to be genuine and we treat it in exactly that same way. Our figures compare very favourably nationally around the number of false alarms that people go to as well. Our reduction rates have been probably a smidge better than most. Um, but if you were to look at any fire and rescue service across the country, you'll see generally speaking that 40, 45 percent, if not 50 percent of calls are classed as false alarms. So we don't stand out across the country, but equally the crews take regular pleasure in reminding me we only come back from false alarms. We don't go to them. Well worth well worth noting and, and thank you for that. I, I don't see any other questions, members. So therefore the recommendation, I mean it was, I'm, I want to say I think it was it is a very positive report uh, and I think it's something we can take forward uh, with confidence from, from this uh, authority. So the recommendation is that the CFA uh, Corporate Governance Committee is asked to note the performance of the Leicestershire Fire and Rescue Service for the periods April 2020 to March 21 and April 21 to uh, May 21, also bringing us really up to date. I will move that from the chair. I have it seconded by Councillor Newton. Thank you. So that is duly noted. So therefore, we go on to agenda item 10, um, which is the external audit update. It's pages 113 to 136 of your agenda pack. And as I introduced him earlier, we have Colin Sharp, who is the Deputy Director of Finance at Leicester City Council, uh, who is here to, to take this paper and, and is representing our Treasurer today. Again, I think, uh, as you read from the pages, 113, 136, it, it is covid impacted and and in fact as you will also read the government who pushed back some of the dates on the audit figures but I, i'll leave it to the to the expert to introduce this uh, over to you colin hopefully we haven't lost you We're speaking to him earlier. Yes, we just hold a minute. Oh, sorry, Chair, were you waiting for me? Yes, we are. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Sorry. I gave you a I gave you a splendid introduction. <laughs> <laughs> and I said I'm handing over to the expert on this one. So without further ado, uh, yes, this this agenda item is over. You have the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so, sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. It all went blank. Yes, uh, this agenda item is a fairly short report, uh, again for information, although it is it is uh, nonetheless of importance. Uh, the uh, and combined Fire Authority's external, external Audit Director, Gavin Barker, uh, sends his apologies. Uh, I think he's rather tied up with new audit committees at the moment, so asked if I would present the uh, update in the report, which I was happy to do. So, yes, uh, I'll 
I will just pick out some key points from the report for you. Then obviously happy happy to take any questions from yourself or members. So the combined fire sergeants, external auditors, Mazar LLP have requested that this audit report, this audit update report, be brought to this committee. So I'm presenting it on their behalf, uh, and the committee is asked to note the report and obviously make any comments, observations, or ask any questions. So the the uh, the covering report uh, covers three items. One is an update on the progress in delivering the external auditors' responsibilities and a summary of recent national reports and publications. And they're set out in more detail in the appendix on Mazars. And then in the covering report, I've also added some narrative on the implications of the update for the combined fire authority. So moving on through the report, uh, the auditors previously reported as being unable to meet the statutory timetable for auditing the 2020-21 uh, financial year's accounts just ended and that he expects the firm will complete the audit by the end of November. That was reported, I think, to the March meeting and that and, and that is still the case that the Mazars expect to complete the external audit by the end of November. Uh, the main reasons for the delay to the auditor for not meeting the, uh, the deadline of end of September, as in regulations, is uh, sort of continued pressure uh, of recruitment to retention on Mazars and indeed other, other or other local authority fire police service audit firms, uh, together with the impact of the pandemic, which is more remote auditing, uh, which has led to backlogs of work, and also. Uh, I think it's also worth adding uh, additional work that's being required by national standards. So over the course of the current audit contract, external auditors have gradually been asked to do more and more. And indeed for the 2021 accounts, there's an enhanced audit focus on value for money uh, and also on financial sustainability and just generally auditors being being more sceptical and more cautious at the start of an audit. So all of this adds to, all of this adds to the resources needed to complete an audit at the time. At Actually, when the audit the audit firms are reported, they've got difficulty recruiting and retaining those resources. So the second section of the appendix, as I say, gives a summary of recent national reports and publications. Obviously, members were able to read those, and I think uh, Neil Jones later in this meeting may refer to one or two of those on his update as well. The final, the final section then, Chair, that I would highlight is uh, my words really around the implications of this for the Combined Fire Authority. So the actual 2021 statements of accounts, we are, work, we are working on that. We're nearly there with that. That Those will be signed by Alison Grinnell as the formal treasurer and will be published uh, during this month, which again is in accordance with the regulatory requirements. And we will bring that draft statement to, back to this committee on the 15th of September. So that will be the, that'll be the foot, your first chance as a committee to actually review that formal statement, check it out, assure yourselves about it, ask us questions on it. Uh, because of the delays to the audit, however, we won't be able to publish that statement of accounts in its final form with the audit certificate by the end of September, as regulations require. Uh, Assuming that Mazars are able to stick to their plan to finish the audit by the end of November, we would look to bring the final audited statement and the audit opinion to the Combined Fire Authority full meeting on the 15th of December and publish it as soon as we can there afterwards. Uh, finally, at paragraph 14, I've noted some of the implications of this in more practical terms. One is that Obviously, the, it means the end of year accounts and audit process goes on for longer, which potentially has an impact on the finance team's workload because they've still got to they're still going to have to respond to audit queries. They'll have to manage the audit work in the autumn, just when we're working on budget monitoring and budget setting for next year. There is also a real risk, I think, that new post balance sheet events will arise. So things that were OK or have been resolved to the end of March may need to be revisited particularly concerned here about changes in asset valuation, so property, plant and equipment in the light of COVID and any any sort of impact of the pandemic on asset valuations uh, and also also the deficit on pension funds. Again, as the McLeod and Sargent uh, 
judgments and immediate detriment start to roll through in more detail and indeed any more changes significant changes to stock market investments uh over the course of the few, next few months so there is always that risk that actually figures that we had set on a good basis in the statement of accounts and have to be re- revisited and re-challenged and that obviously is more work for us more work for the auditor and potentially more cost but there is little, very little that we can do about this. This is this is this is the auditor's uh, position. The auditor has to manage their audit in this, and I'm sure they're doing the best that they can in what are generally difficult circumstances across local authority audit audit this year. Again, thank you, Chair. Yes, well, thank you, uh, Colin, for that. Um, yes, it's just to say to members, of course, that uh, Mazars are our appointed auditors and in fact as as the year progresses with our various meetings they will be uh, presenting uh, a paper or more than one paper to us so they will be here in a physical presence as it were i i think as colin has outlined the delays are really national uh, this is just not a delay which is impacting upon this authority and likewise there is going to be a a a cost increase again the the fees are set nationally from on high it does have an implication um, but we then ask our own officers to make sure that we are shall i say comfortable with that i think that's correct uh, sort of brief summing up colin of what what you outlined and said so um it's very much a, a sort of semi-technical report it, detailed report it's reporting the position uh, as it is but are there any questions uh, members to take forward again this is uh, an item that we visit on a regular basis i you're not being let off that lightly colin i have uh, Catherine <laughs> newton is going to ask you a question thank okay, you thank you chair Catherine newton. i've been on the fire authority for a number of years like Ken. And this is the very first time I think we've ever had a report that uh, has suggested that uh, the position in terms of the auditing has not really been satisfactory. What I would like to ask, can we have assurances that this will not reoccur next year? Did you pick that up, uh, Colin? Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you, Florence. As to, I'm not sure if you can, but um, uh, I'm sure we would do our best. But you, you heard the question. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor Newton. I, I, I obviously not being the auditor can't to give you that assurance. My, my guess is that this could very well occur next year. Uh, there are, there are, I think, some increasingly structural problems with the local authority external local audit market. Uh, as I've said, the the scale fees at the start of the current audit period, three four years ago, were set quite low. I think the firms, have, all the firms, have struggled with that. Uh, audit audit regulations have changed almost every year since auditors have to do more work. They're under more scrutiny. They're they're under greater regulation. There have been obviously failings at some councils: Croydon, Nottingham, Slough, Northamptonshire. There will be others. Uh, auditors are now therefore having to do more work. As I say, the I, I understand that public sector audit is not a particularly attractive. Uh, form of employment for audit, for audit staff coming into the market and some of the more senior staff are concerned about the liabilities that's attached to them personally relative to the fees that it generates. Uh, I think Neil Jones later on when he presents uh, his local audit update will 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 sort of cover some of this but we have, we've had the Redmond review that made recommendations well high, highlighted all these issues and made recommendations about the future of local audit and the public accounts committee only yesterday have issued quite a scathing report which I know Neil intends to cover so so I, so I, th- I think this is going to take some time nationally to resolve and I'll be very old surprised if it's better next year. It may be we're lucky and Mazars are able to audit Leicestershire Fire and Rescue Service according to the time, the proper timetable. But if they do, they probably won't audit somewhere else, would be my guess. Are you happy that uh, I, I I also there's no penetrating supplementary then. There's no difficulty. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, then I'm going to go uh, to uh, Mr. Bray. Mr. Bray. Yes, thank you, Chairman. It's more of a comment rather than a question to to back up what Collins just said. Uh, you know, wearing a different hat. Uh, I'm also leader of Hinkley and Bosworth Borough Council, and I have to say I've had a similar conversation with my chair of audit committee, making very very similar comments to what has been said here. And I think I think it is a problem, and I think all local authorities are going to have to watch yeah. out over this year and and next year, and, and perhaps even beyond, unfortunately. Yes, I think I think I think you heard that, uh, Colin. But the, you're absolutely right. I, I think that, as you say, it, it is a comment, but it's a comment well worth noting. Uh, do you want to add anything to that, Colin? Or uh, yes, chair, e e e e chairman. I think I was on. I was uh, looking at updated information coming out of the sector last week and listening to commentators, and it seems that that about half of local authority audits. The 2021, the current audits are not going to meet the September deadline. Uh, that's what the auditors are currently saying. I mean, one assumes that will can only go up as opposed to go down. So I think that illustrates this is not just one firm. It's not just one one area of the country. This is becoming a national a national problem. Probably half the audits will be late. Mr. Bannister, sorry. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I read the report uh, and I found it very disappointing. Um, I, I note the host of reasons that have been provided uh, that explain the delay uh, in the um, uh, progress of the external audit, uh, but the report itself confirms that because of those delays, it's placing um, uh, what's described as uh, an inconvenience on, on the um, Treasury management team of the authority because of that delay. Uh, they confirm that it's um, not a satisfactory uh, position uh, to be in, and there is uh, not um, great hope for meeting the November uh, deadline. Uh, having gone beyond September, um, there is uh, the phrase assuming we make the November deadline, which uh, begs the question that there may be a further delay. Uh, my question really is in relation to paragraph 17 of the report, uh, which is headed risk that says that there are no risks arising directly from the report. Uh, yet the report itself does refer to um, the issues that, that could impact. And I was just wondering uh, for further clarity as to why that particular phrase that there are no risks uh, arising directly from the report when there may be some indicative risks that are being pointed out. Thank you, Mr. Bannister. We'd like to take that, uh, Colin. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, yes, of course. Yes, I think uh, perhaps perhaps in hindsight that 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 paragraph could highlight could highlight some of the risks that I've probably covered in paragraph 14 of the report I mean I, I think we are we are confident in the statements of accounts and in, our, and in our financial work and therefore I'm not expecting the the audit to reveal anything uh, anything particularly unexpected that would place the the fire authority or its finances at risk as such. This is probably why why I haven't picked any you know, like why I haven't particularly thought to pick anything out out in that section. Uh but 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 clearly until such time as the as the audit is signed off, there is that risk that there is a material error in the accounts that that, that is in the way that they in the way that been prepared that the audit picks up and that would have an impact on the CFA. As I say, obviously I'm confident that isn't the case, but I would accept there are yeah, there are clearly some risks here until the audit is complete, signed and sealed. Mr. Bannister. The... Uh, no, I just want to uh... Uh, thank God for the uh, response. Um, and indeed, the further the matter gets delayed, uh, there must be a consequential increase in in risk. Mm. Yes. I, I, and and from the chair here, I'm not um, seeking to, um, if you like, uh, protect Mazars. But um, prior to the elections, uh, Mazars came to uh, both the CFA and this committee meeting, and they were um, extremely open and honest. I think in setting. Mm problems to the committee and they were actually right and I think as regards to the signing off uh, which new members wouldn't know the signing off of our last set of accounts were to the highest level 
um, you know, I, I think Colin, you may wish to add to that, but uh, they, they find our, our accounts uh, without question uh, uh, first class, and they, they said that within their auditor's report. Um, and I hope that will give a little more confidence. Yeah. Do you want to add that before I move on, Colin, or are you happy? No, I'm happy with that. Thank you. That's fine. Okay, then, members. So if there are, are, are no questions, uh, the recommendation for agenda item 10 is on the papers before you. So I will move the, the external audit process report and the implications for the combined fire authority as set out in paragraphs 11 to 14 are of the report uh, be noted. Could I, could I seek, uh, Mr. Fonseca, could I seek your seconding of that just to... Um, change the, the, the in the minute. Thank you yes, very yes. much for that. So therefore, members, we go to agenda. And sorry, thank you, Colin. Are you staying with us for the rest yes. of your will? Uh, yes, if that's OK, Chair, I'll, I'll stay around and listen particularly to the audit presentation soon, Neil. That'll be quite useful. That's good. Thank you. thank you very much for that most excellent report. So we have agenda item 11 is the service development programme and our plan 2024. It's an update. It's on pages 137 to 150 of your agenda pack. Um, again, and I, I make no excuse for, for saying that, it, it is indeed, it's a positive report. Um, it, it, it is uh, particularly about our plan and uh, there are some emerging considerations regarding Grenfell and uh, quite a demanding um, escape plan in changes which are our chief this is this is a, a report I think you're going to find uh, very interesting members so it's over to you chief thank you uh, thank you chair. I, I always find this report incredible as I pull it together and Chris Moyer briefs me on it because it kind of really shows just the sheer amount of work that's going on across the service across a multitude of different different disciplines and different departments and commonly not all of that is front of house so it really kind of gives the opportunity to, to stress to yourselves and, and the community the sheer amount of work that's going on across Leicestershire Fire and Rescue Service. Um, I'm only going to highlight a few of the areas that I think are coming to some re really good fruition, but there, there's some real gems and nice stuff in there. So on page 139 of the bundle, paragraph 16 is the virtual fatal four project. This is now coming to its conclusion, which will see us launch a um, very interactive, very new um, mobile experience across the, the service area. Um, it has been slightly delayed due to COVID and the schools not being present. So we're actually, as we speak, bringing together a um, go live or launch event, hopefully in mid-September, which members will be invited to. This is a country leading product um, with the Fire and Rescue Service it's leading the way with virtual reality and bringing that into road safety. Um, it's a, a particular concern across the country around the number of collisions, number of people injured. So it's a real innovative experience that will improve young drivers' knowledge, experience, learning and understanding of the risks that road safety bring. Um, paragraphs 27 and 28 on page 140 relate to the Oracle system. These two small paragraphs go nowhere near to justifying the sheer amount of work that's going on with that. Oracle is a new training database, record database and content um, holder, I suppose, for, for want of a better word. It's a completely new training system that's coming into the service. Um, it's being developed internally by our learning and development team uh, over at Loughborough. Um, this will not only greatly improve our training records and ability to demonstrate competence for the staff, more importantly, it's actually going to really improve the end user experience. So those crews and staff out on station teams and departments should, should get a much better experience and it will actively contribute towards our H Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabularies and Fire Action Plan and is also a direct response to some of our staff survey comments fed from our staff. So a, a real example of they're saying and we're doing so really really positive um finally on page 141 uh, paragraphs 39 and 40 following its successful reintroduction of the service ed identity or badge last year um and the existing current uh, corporate workwear project coming to an end this is a new project that we've just commenced that has been heavily influenced and led by the staff to give a fit for purpose but also a inspiring uniform for our staff that they really want so that they can be proud of our service and ultimately the prouder they are of our service the uh, the better they are going to interact with our community um, and then moving on with regards to our plan 
Um, there are a couple of pieces of work that the chairman's alluded to. I do think we I need to raise to your attention. Um, so the Grenfell outcomes, which is page, paragraphs 43 and 44 on page 142, and the tall buildings work, page 47 and 48, 100, sorry, let me say that again, I got myself confused. Uh, the Grenfell outcomes on paragraphs 43 and 44 on page 142, and then the tall buildings work on the next page, paragraphs 47 and 48. There is, there is currently a consultation launched by the government around some potential legislation changes. Um, this all follows on from the Grenfell Tower event and the, the tragic circumstances that arrived at that. So the consultation is currently live regarding PEEPS, P-E-E-P-S, which is Personal Escape and Evacuation Plans. This has the potential to add a significant burden to fire and rescue services and an even larger burden to local authorities or housing providers. Um, essentially, it means when you house any individual primarily in a tall building or a high rise building, every individual will need a personal escape and evacuation plan of how they would vacate the building in the event of fire. That would need to consider individual circumstances such as age, mobility, disability, mental impairment, or any other factor. Um, bearing in mind the number of people that are housed in those types of um, properties across the service area um, and the frequency that may, may or may not move around, that's a considerable piece of work for the local authority. Equally, the PEEP plan, the way I understand it at the moment, shouldn't consider the fire service as the evacuation strategy. There should be another evacuation strategy in place. If that fails, that is when the fire and rescue service would, would become involved. Equally, the sharing of that information and data of the PEAT plans is a significant piece of work. Um, and that is out for consultation currently. And I would expect probably that to go through legislation after the summer recess of parliament. Uh, coupled with that, there may well also be some further legislative changes around fire protection and our involvement of frequency of inspections, et cetera. What I would say is it's not all um, concerning news. Um, as a service and as an authority, we've seen this coming for the last sort of 12, 18 months. We've increased the, increased the establishment in the fire protection team to prepare the organisation for some of this work and to continue the increased number of audits that I positively spoke about earlier. Um, but I do think it's fair that the committee should, should be cited on the, the emerging issues as they come forward. And then finally, paragraphs 72 and 74 relate to the fire standards. Um, after many years of localism, uh, fire rescue services have developed local and regional standards, and that is now being centralised again. So the fire standards board have been um, have been put together and are now issuing a number of standards. So there's only um, four or five that have come out so far. The reason why I mention it today is the most recent one that has come out is called the Core Code of Ethics and may well need to be fed into the constitution of the CFA at a later date as we conform to it. Um, I think it's important to stress as a fire rescue service, we of course will look to introduce those national standards as soon as reasonably practical, but it may well have some impact coming through to um, uh, either our codes of conduct or standards of behaviour. Um, thank you, Chair. I'm conscious I've whizzed through probably quite a lot of information there. And again, the report's quite large, but happy to take any questions. Well, in, indeed, and and thank you, thank you, Chief, for that. Uh, well, as I say, it is indeed a, a very positive report, and you have given us the early notice, as it were, on the emerging considerations with Grenfell, and and there's absolutely no doubt we will be taking that at probably a CFA meeting and certainly future meetings of of, of this authority. Um, and I think the the other thing which may not be covered in the report is that uh, following Grenfell, of course. The fire authority under under your headship, as it were, you carried out a really intensive audit of all high-rise buildings within this authority, and you have everything mapped out. So if there is a fire in a high-rise building, you are immediately on alert, and you've already carried out that audit, and you know what you are approaching. And of course, you also had that wonderful opportunity to have what was the building you had here in I think members might be used to, you had the building which was the very high building in Leicester City where you had smoke and a fire I and mean, you were getting phone calls from all around saying there's a fire on this building but it was really a, a, a tr real you know vital training experience over several days uh, Sorry, I'm going on too much, but you might just like to acquaint members of, and then we'll open it to any questions. Absolutely. I think it, it's it, you're right to raise it, Chair, actually. Operationally, we are incredibly competent when it comes to um, high rise or fires in tall buildings. Um, 
the the building you mentioned was Goscott House in in City. And we were able to do a number of um, as close to real exercises as possible. Um, we did it at night to increase some of the the testing and uh, aesthetics of it. Um, we had fake smoke and um, fake fire lights, and we received about 15 calls reporting a high rise fire, which kind of shows the realism. But I think building on from that as well, we regularly test and exercise our high rise procedures. We've also been down to the fire service college where we are able to set fire to buildings in a as it's not a, well, it is as close, close to real to life as we can possibly possibly get our crews equip themselves very very well um operationally i am very content that we have all the procedures in in place that we possibly can have i myself attended one only, only two or three months ago and was suitably impressed by all the the crews and the levels of command um but obviously the operational response is one, one element. The fire protection aspect, which is the bit I'm talking about today, is another element that is continuously evolving. Uh, we've got it on the radar, but it, it may well be a significant impact both for ourselves and local authorities, to be honest. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Members, are there any uh, additional comments to that? I say this is a, a paper that we will be taking um, in the future, not once, but on several occasions as it unfolds, I guess. So, I assume, sorry, yes, Mr. Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the report. Thank you very much. And I was very interested in the the work following on from the initial Grenfell recommendations and tall buildings work that was going on. I was also quite interested in um, the corporate workwear project that, that's going on. And um, at the risk of sounding just a little bit flippant, which I don't intend to be, um, when I read paragraph 39, I did a little double take about the project to procure replacement corporate workwear and undress uniform and i did wonder whether undress was the right word whether it should be non-dress uniform i think you should lend some clarity to that um i can add some fire service clarity um traditionally our our very posh and formal occasion uniform is defined as undress, which I believe is, an, is a naval tradition where the fire rescue services come from. But I totally accept the point. It sounds a little bit um, peculiar. Well, I think we'll take that as answered. Perhaps on a, a future me meeting, we may just uh, delve in. The, the, the history of, of the fire uh, service is, is fascinating. And it goes right back, actually, to Greek and Roman times. It, 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 but, but the culture and the terminology of the watches, et cetera, and pumps, fire, it's not a fire engine, it's a fire pump, is very much naval. But we, we may address that on a, on, on a future uh, meeting. So if there are no other uh, questions, then members, I, uh, the recommendation before us, I, I move that the progress made since March 21, 2021, rather than the delivery of projects within the service development program and the tasks that are included in our plan 2020 to 2024 uh, be noted. Um, move from the chair. Mr. Champion, can I ask you to do the honours? Thank <coughs> you. Indeed. So therefore, we move on to agenda item 12 um, and we have our head of uh, internal audit uh, service annual report uh, 2021. It pages 151 to 194 in your agenda pack. And I'm delighted that we have uh, Neil Jones, who is head of the internal audit service, uh, not so much here, but online uh, to present the report to us today. Um, are you, <coughs> Colin, that I go straight to Neil? I think the answer is yes. The floor yes, is that's fine. Yes, that's fine. Thank you, Chairman. Yes. No, I'm more than happy, Chair. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, and you're quite right. It's agenda item 12, page 151, and it's my annual report for 2020 21. And um, before I just go into the report, um, we had a very useful training session earlier today. Uh, and I did mention at that that I'm, I'm actually uh, employed as the head of internal audit service for the county council. But obviously the treasurer procures uh, and arranges for the combined fire authorities internal audit function to be provided by my team. Regular members will know that I'm normally uh, be uh, accompanied by Matt Davis, uh, but I think he's sunning himself down in Dorset somewhere this week. But uh, he normally deletes on delivering the audit plan. Uh, so uh, I, hopefully he's left me with any answers to questions that you may have. Um, so this paper explains that I'm required under what's known as the public sector internal audit standards to present an annual report and it's to what the standards refer to as the board and for the CFA the board is the corporate governance committee. 
And my annual report is part of the evidence to support the production of the authority's annual governance statement. So paragraph six of the cover explains that there are specific requirements to incorporate into the annual report. And the most important of those being the head of internal audit's opinion on the overall adequacy and effectiveness of the CFA's control environment. That is its combined frameworks and systems of governance, risk management and internal control. So in terms of how I reached my opinion for 2021, I might ask members if they could firstly turn to Annex 1, which starts on page 163 of your pack. That's the page where the shaded he header uh, covers over the number, which unfortunately makes it uh, a little bit difficult to read. But starting on page 164, I explain how I use a combination of evidence to reach the opinion, including the findings of audits, which are summarised in Annex 2, which are pages 169 to 179. I also evaluate the control environment through observations, for instance, the associated governance through committees, of which this is one of them, uh, revisions and adoptions to policies and procedures. So across the country, heads of internal audit are, are pretty much free to determine how they form their opinion. I personally choose to comment on the, each of the three subcomponents of governance, risk management and control. And whereas individual audit engagements provide a targeted micro assurance, the overall opinion is different in that it's a bit based on a macro assurance over a defined period, which is the financial year. So I have to bring together all of the assurance threads using themes, trends and evidence and professional judgment to provide a holistic insight into the organisation. My opinion, which once again this year is positive, is listed at the bottom of page 165 in bold font, and that's repeated in the annual report itself and summarised in the headlines of the cover report. The overall opinion reflects that it, it, isn't, it, it isn't possible to provide audit coverage over all systems and processes, and no system of internal control can provide absolute assurance against material misstatement or loss nor as we as your internal auditor can give absolute assurance, especially given an unlimited resources. So for 2021, in summary, I reported reasonable assurance that the that overall the control environment was adequate and effective. And as I say, that is a positive response. Whilst there were isolated, higher rated weaknesses identified for isolated issues, controls to mitigate key risks are generally operating effectively and management does assist us in pushing those forward. <clears throat> Before I move on, are there any questions on forming the opinion? OK, fine. carry on. No, I think it's fine. Uh, might I now ask members then to move back to page 157, which is headed the appendix. That is the actual annual report itself. And after some background on page 158, I'll repeat the overall opinion towards the top of page 159. Starting through the next paragraph, 7 to 15, is where I provide summary context on the information contained in the annexes, explaining that for the 10 planned audits, two return substantial assurance. We're awaiting closure on two other assurance type audits. We also concluded three advisory audits and completed the National Fraud Initiative work. We tend to leave some time unplanned for emerging issues, and that was prudent in 2021. So we were able to provide assurance on ICT controls uh, over the remote working during the COVID-19 pandemic. And just a reminder that any reports that do return any outcomes of partial assurance, I explained this to members this morning, will remain in the committee's domain until I'm satisfied that the recommendations are closed and controls are embedded. Pleasingly, two legacy high importance recommendations around the ICT change control and the previous payroll provider were closed off during the year. The paragraph 16 to 19 outline how the service performed with virtually all the audits completed and a slight surplus of days provided. Management was satisfied with overall with the service provided. And then paragraphs 20 and 21 really are reflect the internal workings of the service and I conduct self assessments which have led me to confirm that the service generally conforms to the standards and whilst there were a couple of quality improvements that were added, three smaller ones have been closed. The County Council did redeploy some of its internal audit staff during the, during the pandemic, but that didn't affect the service that was provided to uh, the fire service. And finally, at paragraph 23, a reminder that the annual report helps to inform the annual governance statement, 
which I think is going to be presented to September's committee meeting with the accounts. So the headlines uh, from the main cover report in paragraph seven uh, on page 152 is that once again an overall positive opinion. Uh, the majority or for virtually all of the planned work was achieved. A small surplus of days was provided, but it was retained with the budget and uh, positive self-assessment of the services conforms to standards and quality. That's my annual report for 2021. I'll gladly take any questions. Yes, well, well thank you, Neil. The, the report is indeed uh, very uh, comprehensive, very uh, professional as always. It, it really does set the scene as to exactly where we are, but um, I will look to members if there are, are any other questions. No, well, I, I think that actually answers it. What I've said, it is a very professional report, and, uh, and I thank you, uh, Neil, for that. Uh, you're not going to get off just that like quite likely because you're going to be on stage for the, the next report in a moment. But, uh, members, the, the recommendation for Agenda 12 is before you. So, from the chair, I move that the Head of Internal Audit Service Annual Report 2021 be noted. Um, Mr. Bray, can I ask you to do the honours? Thank you very much, sir. It's proposed by me, seconded by Mr. Bray. Thank you. So, therefore, uh, agenda item 13 is the developments in local brackets external audit arrangements. Um, shorter pages, 195 to 200 of your agenda pack. Uh, and so, without further ado, Neil, uh, back to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think he may have been briefed earlier on that I'll, I'll present the report as was present, uh, put into the pack, but then I do have a small update afterwards. Uh, so once once I've taken any questions on the report, I'll provide a small update uh, on another report that's come out recently. Um, so this is gender item 13, starting on page 195, and it is a further update on developments in local brackets external audit arrangements. And uh, for, for members who've been at the committee over the last couple of years, it, this is the fourth paper that I bought, uh, and it's around about on the independent review of the effectiveness of local external audit and the transparency of local authority financial reporting. And more commonly, it's known as the Redmond Review. It has been referred to earlier on today. So starting paragraph six on this report, it explains that in May, the government published an update report containing its plans for further implementing Redmond recommendations. Of, of importance was the government's proposal that a system leadership for local audit would be best placed with the yet to be implemented audit reporting and governance authority rather than a new arm's length body that's going to be replacing the financial report, the Finance Reporting Council. So paragraph nine explains that some further safeguards and redistribution responsibilities are proposed, but the arrangements for procurement and contract management for local government external auditors will remain with the public sector audit appointments limited and, and the uh, government will support with uh, the next procurement. So recognising that proposed reforms will take time, the government will take an increased leadership role in the interim and there will be public consultation on the proposals ahead of the summer recess. Paragraph 12 explains that two further consultations relating to Redmond recommendations, one on amending the local audit amending person regulations and one on the method of distributing £15 million pounds worth of additional funding to assist meeting additional fees have recently been undertaken and as yet the outcomes are unknown. Paragraph 13 explains uh, at the time that the government's proposals have been mostly welcomed by stakeholders, but there is a wide range of views on the available skills and capacity and market instability, most of which have been discussed earlier on and I will discuss a little further, uh, and the costs of, local uh, costs of local audit remain very guarded. So starting on paragraph four, I, I explain now that the next round of procurements for external audits starting for the financial year 2023-24 are being planned. So rather than make its own arrangements, I think Colin mentioned this, the, the, the CFA has previously opted for the PSAA, Public Sector Audit Appointments Led Procurement. So as part of its planning, PSAA has been consulting on its perspectives. 
it's the PSAA's view, and they're not alone, uh, that the audit market will continue to be relatively unstable and difficult to predict for a further period of time as the government continues to develop and implement responses to four related independent reviews. And it, all, and it considers that local government audit will not be immune from these difficulties. The, the PSA prospectus includes plans to adjust the procurement ratio between quality and costs from what was an equal 50-50 to an 80-20, i.e. the focus of appointing external auditors will be clearly on quality, not on cost. There is a lot of nervous in the local government's, nervousness in the local government sector about this proposal, in that whilst quality is clearly important, costs must not be excessive. The consultation on the prospectus closed on the 8th of July, uh, and I'll close off uh, this part of the report by informing them that a further report will be brought to the committee once the consultations are concluded, and I'll gladly take any questions on the report. But before I do, I'm aware that the Treasurer did compile a response. So, does Colin, did you want to add anything around the PSSA uh, consultation? Uh, if not. No. no if, I think, sorry, Colin, that was, you're, you're leaving that to no. Neil. Okay. No, uh, so, no, so, Chair, yes, right. Neil responded, I believe, for the County Council. I responded for the City Council, very much in agreement right. with how the County Council had responded, although, like, some, some slight differences, but nothing particularly mm. significant. We didn't respond specifically for the fire service, but, say, we have, bo we have both responded for our own respective organisations. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Colin. I threw that on, on you a little bit there, sorry. You know. Um, so on, on, before I move on to what I mentioned earlier on, Chair, are there any, any questions on the report as it stands? Just looking around the room, I mean, within this one, we're being asked to make any observations, etc. for forward. But uh, again, I think the report is probably saying it all. No, back, <coughs> back to you, sir. No, uh, well, thank you, Chair. So. Um, Colin alluded to this uh, again earlier on, uh, but literally hot off the press uh, today, I think the, the publication date is, uh, the Public Accounts Committee has launched a report titled Local Auditor Reporting on Local Government in England. And, it, and it's a very scathing report of the government saying that Whitehall's oversight of local government audit has become increasingly complacent and the proposed solution involves treating public audit as an afterthought. As mentioned by Colin, uh, less than half of local authority audits met the deadline for completion and half of those uh, re reported uh, examined by the Financial Reporting Council needed more limited improvement. So it's pretty dire status, really. In terms of my report today, uh, mentioning uh, the, uh, the, the government's proposal for the sector uh, leader, the, the, the uh, uh, Public Accounts Committee does question uh, whether the pressing need for the new system leadership uh, in local audit is uh, identified in the Redmond view will actually be met by the government's proposal uh, by Arga. Uh, and that won't be set up until 2023 at the earliest, which is more than four years since an oversight body was proposed by Redmond. The committee, the Public Accounts Committee, is unclear whether it will then be fully able to address the current failings in the audit market uh, for auditing local authorities. And, and in the meantime, they consider the government hasn't given enough credible detail on addressing the urgent problems uh, that cannot wait for that uh, sector body, Arga, to be uh, constituted. So the committee has asked the government to write and explain the accountability and governance arrangements for the new organisation and how its performance will be monitored and evaluated. Talking about fees, it's also recommended that uh, the public accounts committee is also recommended that the government should ensure that the next procurement exercise beginning in uh, 2021 supports a fee regime for local government audit, which is appropriately funded and which brings fees into line with the cost of the work. It's unlikely the response, responses to the public accounts committee uh, from government will have been received in time to report to September committee so uh, it will probably be need to be reported in November. So that was just an update chair. I know it's been discussed at length today and questions have been asked uh, in terms of the, the situation local to the CFA uh, but that's a nationwide uh, response by public accounts co committee which uh, I think you'll agree is, is relatively scathing of the government. That's all I have to say chair. Yeah, well, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Neil. Indeed, yes, 
Redmond report and, and all that report on standards has, has been uh, some time in the making and we've actually taken that report on previous audit reports and uh, whatever. <coughs> I think uh, enough said on that. I think you, you've outlined that and, and it is in the written format there. Um, just looking around to members if there are any questions. Um, I, I think not. Have you concluded that therefore the whole I, I have, yes, thank you, Chair. So we can, and we will revisit that again. I think we're being asked as a committee for observations, but I think to pass on observations, but I think personally we can rest assured that, if you like, our experts, both in the city and in the county, and from certainly on my behalf on Rutland, uh, I think we have made all those views known, and I think the expert view has gone forward. So if you are uh, content with that, members, I, I will thank you, Neil, for this, your second report. Um, we will, that will be going forward again, as we know, on future occasions in a slightly different format. But I will move, therefore, from the chair that the report detailing the de developments in local external audit arrangements be noted. I wonder, Mr. Valland, can I take your name to second that? Will that be okay? Yeah, I second that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So, therefore, members, we move. Uh, thank you again, Colin. Uh, you're very welcome to stay for the the short period uh, that we have left on the meeting. Yeah. Um, agenda item 14 is our penultimate report in procurement of the annual report uh, 2020 to 21. It's pages, so get, oh, get, get an even less, pages 201 to 204. You're doing a very good job here, Chief, um, of your agenda pack. Um, and really, uh, straight to you, Chief, to take this one. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. A, a very brief update, to be honest. Um, this is a procedural report to demonstrate compliance against uh, contracts and procedural rules. Um, you'll note in paragraph five, um, the number of procurements or significant procurements we've made throughout the process. Paragraph six and seven shows no issues, notices or challenges outside of uh, normal procurement rules um, occurred. And section eight describes the direction of travel with regard to joining the blue light portal database. And finally, paragraph nine shows that only two waivers were agreed for the year, um, which in the grand scheme of things offer relatively small amounts. Um, I'm not sure I need to dwell much further on that chair, so I'm happy to take any questions. Members, again, fairly concise report, quite detailed, early days for this new committee. Right, OK then. So therefore, members, again from the chair, um, I move that the summary of procurement activity in 2020 to 21, as required by Rule 192 of the Contracts Procedure Rules 2018, uh, be noted. I will move that uh, from the chair. Um, Mr. Gatorair, could I take your name as a seconder for that? Perfect. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So therefore, uh, members, we will move on uh, to our final report, uh, which is a governance update. It's pages 205 to 216 of your agenda pack. And I'm delighted that we've got Lauren Haslam, our monitoring officer, uh, to, who will report, uh, present this report. Uh, the chair is yours. Thank you. Lauren, Lauren. Lauren thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, this is the last in a, a suite of um, annual reports uh, that presented to the committee this afternoon. Um, just to give an overview and update on governance related issues, um, so far as they affect the scene. Lauren, I wonder, I'm being extremely rude, could you move the microphone just a little closer? Um, I'm not sure that it's that coming through, but I'm sure that would be better. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Chair, I hope, hope that's better for colleagues. Um, so if I skip straight through, it's a short report, but I'll skip straight to page 206, the second page of the report, and simply to thank members of the CFA um, who have all completed the register of interests um, required. That's attached to Appendix A for information. The register of officers' interests um, has been touched on earlier on by um, the CFO uh, in his presentation, is subject to uh, an update take account of the um, guidance that's been issued in the Code of Ethics issued um, uh, for, for fire authorities. Uh, so that's being uh, subject to um, an update at 
present, but for now, simply to note that the register is reviewed at a regular intervals by myself and colleagues within the CFA and internal audit. Um, nothing of note um, has been identified or of concern. And that, as you'll see, I've referred to is cross-checked with the um, National Fraud Initiative as well as a second um, um, way really of double checking that all, all is in order. Uh, similarly with the Register of Gifts and Hospitality, that's checked at regular intervals and reminders issued to staff um, to ensure that um, gifts and hospitality are appropriately registered and recorded. Um, nothing of concern um, to note in relation to that. Um, I'll skip over um, 10, 11, 12 and 13. There's nothing um, to add to what's in the report. It's simply to note um, those uh, additional uh, governance tools available to the CFA. Um, the main change, I think, is in paragraph 15 onwards, the core code of ethics, um, which, as you'll see, is um, recently launched and uh, by the LGA following uh, Sir Tom Windsor's recommendations uh, in 2019. Um, the principles that are contained within the code are set out in the report and locally um, we'll, the service will be working through those um, principles to make sure that our suite of policies uh, for governance are amended if, if necessary to reflect the um, new uh, guidance that's been offered to us. Um, there's nothing else um, that I wanted to bring to members' attention in relation to the governance, and I simply ask members to note the contents of the report. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Lauren. Um, members, are there any are there any questions? No, right. Well, again, uh, 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 again, it's a very uh, concise and uh, correct report. I, I think uh, the beauty of these reports is that they're very clear and they set out uh, the scene exactly as it is. Um, so therefore, um, I will move again from the chair that the update provided on the governance and ethical issues uh, be noted. Um, I'm looking for a seconder. Mr. Neil Champion, thank you very much. Yes, sorry, yes, um, Mr. Barrister, sorry. Thank you very much, and that's seconded. Um, so that concludes the main agenda items today. Um, agenda item 16 is urgent items, and as mentioned earlier, we, we have no urgent items. So agenda item 17, uh, it's the date of the next meeting. Uh, the next meeting is to be held on Wednesday, the 15th of September um, at two o'clock. Um, venue will be decided a little nearer the time. But as I always do, I always remind members that um, our next full meeting of the CFA is to be held on the 28th of July at 10 o'clock. And I think we are fairly certain it will, in fact, be, be in this uh, chamber. So um, it uh, remains me uh, for me, members, to thank you all uh, for attending this uh, first meeting for some of you of this committee. And uh, also I note uh, for thank Mr. Orson, uh, who's listening in, and any members of the public that may have joined us. So I will thank you again for your attendance, and I will close the meeting at 3.43. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.